Hi folks, I'm Gabe Turner. And I'm Aliza Vigderman. And this is Are We in the Future? Are We in the Future is a podcast where we watch movies and TV shows with smart home, cybersecurity, or home security elements and answer the important questions about the technology itself. Does this exist today? Can this exist today? Should this exist today? What modern technology would have made this movie last only up through the first act? And of course, are we in the future? This week, we watched Panic Room, a 2002 thriller directed by David Fincher and starring a bombastic cast of Jodie Foster, Kristen Stewart, Jared Leto, Forrest Whitaker, Dwight Yoakam, just really bringing the heat. Uh, You might know Fincher from some of his other movies like Fight Club, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, The Social Network, Gone Girl. You know, this guy knows how to make a film. Yeah, so Jodie Foster plays Meg Altman, who is a recent divorcee, and she has a 10-year-old daughter named Sarah, who's played by a very young Kristen Stewart. And her daughter has diabetes, but I'm not just telling you that. It's actually going to be relevant to the plot at some point. So they move into this gigantic house on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, largest home I've ever seen in New York. Big crib. Like, for two people? Yeah, out of control. Seemed unnecessary, but... The home actually has a panic room with steel doors, surveillance camera monitors, a PA system, which is not something you normally see outside of a school, and a separate phone line. So we don't know this initially, but apparently the previous owner had constructed this panic room to protect his bearer bonds, um, $22 million worth. And now, Gabe, I know this isn't the Freakonomics podcast, but can you explain to me what bearer bonds are? Only if we call each other Stephen. Go on, Stephen. Well, Stephen, bearer bonds are bonds where no records are kept of the owner, so anyone can turn them over for cash. Basically, if you have the paper in your hand, you own the money. So in terms of home security, this is a nightmare, as it incentivizes robbers to choose your house if they know you have bearer bonds. Because once they're gone, there's really nothing you can do to recover that money. Ouch town. Yeah. So basically, they're not the most secure and are actually more commonly used by criminals, uh, like money launderers, tax evaders, uh, according to like Investopedia. Now, the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1982 actually outlawed new bear bonds in the United States. So you can still use existing bear bonds that you have, but you won't be able to buy any new ones. Sort of like the original Beanie Babies. <laughs> yeah, that is an apt and adorable comparison. Right. And Junior, played by Jared Leto, knows the bear bonds are in the house because he's the grandson of the previous owner. And by the way, he does have cornrows in this movie, um, which I found shocking. Yeah, it is shocking. Like it's when you don't expect it. Mm, mm, But it is Jared Leto. I didn't even know Jared Leto was in the movie, let alone that he had cornrows. (laughs) Anyway, so he goes, he hires Burnham, who's played by Forrest Whitaker, and Raul, who's played by Dwight Yoakam. So... Burnham is probably the most interesting character of the three because he actually installs these panic rooms for a living. So he knows exactly how they work. And he's kind of the moral center of the robbers. You know, he's doing it to support his daughter, unlike Raul, who's just super violent and aggressive. Yeah. And I had to make a really quick point. I feel like Jared Leto probably just came to the set with those cornrows on and like no one told him and no one told him to come like that. Or they were, <laughs> and, and like they asked him like, please take them out. And he was like, no. He's like, no, this is my character now. But anyway. It's written into my contract <laughs> that I have to keep the rose in. The exactly. rose stay or I go. <laughs> exactly. Uh, he's also, can we just talk about like, not to go on a tangent, but like, how old is Jared Leto? I feel like he's been in his early 30s for 20 years. Yeah, yeah, he easily. Doesn't age. Doesn't age. Jordan Catalano. <laughs> so, right, long story short, the burglars enter the home of Megan and Sarah, and they go into the panic room. Uh, well, rather, Meg and Sarah go into the panic room where the bear bonds are actually stored in a safe. So Junior hadn't realized that they had moved in early, uh, which definitely puts a snag in the robber's plans. So their first thought is to cut off the phone line inside the panic room. And since Meg dropped her phone, uh, she has no way of contacting the police. 
Um, and the initial thing they do is the robbers like gas her and her daughter, Kristen Stewart, uh, trying to make them come out. But eventually they realize that if Meg and Sarah die, they'll never get into the panic room. Which is a tough situation to be in. I mean, we've all been there, right? Yes. Um, (laughs) And, you know, Megan or Meg, whatever you want to call her, she tries everything to get help, you know, yelling, shining a flashlight to her neighbors. She even leaves the panic room to get her cell phone and she's able to call her husband who stupidly, I thought, just comes to the house and of course, you know, gets beaten by the robbers. But it turns out he did also notify the police and they show up a bit later, but then Meg has to pretend everything's fine. And it's like one of those things where you're like screaming at the screen, like, just tell them, like, tell them. And mm. she's like, why are you guys here? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Cause she wants her daughter to live, which is valid because they're in, at this point they're in the panic room with her and she needs her insulin shot. Mm-hmm. So she's depending on Burnham to give it to her. And because he's a decent human at the end of the day, he does give it to her and she does not die. Yes. Which was very kind of him. Yes. And right before that happened, I think we should point out that Raul actually shoots and kills Junior, uh, Jared Leto, who had not disclosed all the money they actually had in that safe. So, you know, there's a number of like fight scenes between Megan and Raul. um, And then, you know, basically Burnham, Forrest Whitaker, does break into the safe, makes her run for it, but when he sees that Raul is about to kill Meg with a mallet, uh, which is very Looney Tunes, um, Burnham- <laughs> I didn't think of it that way, but- Burnham returns to save her. Unfortunately for him, the police have also arrived and he is forced to let go of the $22 million in bearer bonds and they fly away in the wind like that song by Kansas. All we are is dust in the wind. Yeah, and then, you know, really dramatic, like he escapes and then he comes back and then the money flies away. And then I found it odd that they just had at the end of the movie, just Megan and Sarah looking, reading the newspaper, looking for a new home. Yeah, I feel like they have like PTSD at this point. They seemed fine. They were like in Central Park. Yeah, they were just lounging. Reading the real estate section, which is honestly crazy to think about. That's how you (laughs) had to find housing. Like You you had like six options. (laughs) With no pictures. <laughs> um, it's like, anyway. Yeah, New York real estate. The ending of this movie was weird because you don't really get the just desserts that you want because Raul gets away, Jared is dead, so that's an escape of sorts, and then Burnham gets caught and he was the nicer one. Yeah. So it's not like, it's an interesting No, end. Raul dies. Wait. Did you forget what happened at the end of the movie? I forgot Raul died. Oh, he got he got shot, yeah. He got shot. Okay, so they escape through death, but then Burnham has to go to jail? Yeah, he, That's well, f- yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I mean, conceivably, you know, they, they could have, like, asked because he saved their life. That could have been a mitigating factor. And who knows, maybe he gets less time. I hope so. Yeah, we're going to get into the criminal elements of yes, it. Yes, we so will. So let's, let's, let's jump into that. Because Gabe is a lawyer. <laughs> Um, so yeah, yeah. Th- this movie had a lot of technology that was super relevant to home security and surveillance in general. There are CCT, CCTV cameras, a PA system, and a separate phone line. Yeah, but of course this movie was made in 2002, so it was a very different time. However, a lot of the things in the movie are elements that we still do see today. Um, although most security cameras at this point have two-way audio, so you probably wouldn't need a separate PA system. Right, and another element is really interesting is that at least for products like Amazon Alexa, uh, if you have an Echo in one room and an Echo in another room, it actually does serve as a PA system. You can just make any announcement that you'd like to make uh, from one, and everyone in the house near an Amazon Echo device will hear it. Great Um, point. Yeah. (laughs) Now, it wasn't entirely clear from the movie how much was being recorded on the cameras, but we do know that it was most likely only being recorded locally, uh, so no one else outside of the house could actually access any of that footage. Yeah, and that's, we talk a lot about cloud and local storage, and we have good reason, because if you accidentally drop your micro SD card into your coffee, and that's where all your footage of your home being grabbed is, you don't have it anymore. But if you also saved it in encrypted cloud storage, it's over for those robbers. <laughs> they should be shaking right now. 
<laughs> but in this movie, the one smart thing that the robbers did was they cut the phone lines in the panic room. And I was wondering, what are the protections against that in 2019? Because I know we don't have landlines, but can someone just completely cut off access to the police at, at this point? Well, if you have cellular backup, it doesn't matter if the phone lines are cut because you'll be connected directly to your professional monitoring team just through that cellular connection. So they can go in and check your cameras. They can verify if an emergency uh, has taken place and even call the police for you. Uh, clearly, this would have become really in handy for Meg and Sarah. Um, in addition, you can just use your you know, Wi-Fi and contact the police in your cell phone normally as cell service tends to be better in 2019 than it was in 2002, or at least that's what Verizon and AT&T tell us all the time. I feel like it must be true because I it was a big part of culture being like, I only have two bars. Mm. That, it was in jokes a lot. It was in jokes. It was in jokes. And, you know, I never th- even think about my bars. Mm, you don't, you don't, I have issues sometimes around here with mine. I think it's because I have Verizon Ooh, and yeah. it just seems to have like better. CDMA service. network maybe works better where we are than my GSM network. It's hard when you're from a different place. For example, Wells Fargo is my bank. There's almost no Wells Fargo's in New York. It's hard. It's hard. There's a Chase Bank every block in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. yet the Wells Fargo's are at Penn Station. Don't want to go there. Yeah. Heinous. One near Union Square, also don't want to go there. Oof, rough. Next to that Trader Joe's. Oof, no. Though I did see Gabrielle Union there once and it changed oh, my life. Oh my God. I can't yeah. believe she like deigned to shop there. <laughs> she That's, wasn't shopping. She was just walking around. Union oh, Square. okay. I was like, <laughs> looking like she's a goddess. better than that. Yeah, it was yeah. looking like a goddess. She's the best. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway. <laughs> okay. So, so, yeah, cellular, I'm so sorry, we got very off topic. Cellular backup is definitely your best bet, as is 24 professional monitoring. <coughs> and then also we've seen some security systems have apps that have safety buttons. So all you have to do to contact the police is just press that button. You don't actually have to call. And that's great if you're in hiding, you don't want to make a sound, super easy. Exactly. And although Meg drops her... A cordless phone before she enters the actual panic room. It's hard to believe that that would happen to anyone in like 2019. Not that we aren't clumsy anymore, but like you have <laughs> something on you at all times to make things out. Like she had to grab her cordless phone. Like no, it would have been. It would have been in her pocket. It would have been in her pocket. She would have had it. Um, so with wearables like smart watches, especially, it's rare that we're without some type of smart device. Uh, I know I can make calls from my Apple Watch. But let's talk more about burglary in general uh, and in 2019, as it's still one of the more common crimes. It is. So this movie is actually really accurate in one way in particular. I looked at data from the U.S. Department of Justice, and what they found is that single females and children have the highest rates of burglary when someone is home. And then the least likely per group of people, I guess, to be burgled when someone is home are childless married couples. So if you do not want to get robbed, get married, but do not have children is, is what I take away from that. Interesting. Interesting. And do like, like does the type of house matter for burglaries? Great question. The most likely residential space to be robbed when no one is home is a hotel, a motel, or a rooming service like Airbnb. And that accounted for 36.5% of burglaries when no one was home. And then the next is mobile homes at 32.4%, and then houses or apartments at 22.1%. In general, rental properties are more likely to be burgled, and then single unit houses or houses with 10 or more units are the least likely to be burgled when someone is home. Again, this information is coming from the U.S. Department of Justice. Now, what if there's a security system in place? Yeah, so Megan and Sarah had a really nice system in place, but it didn't actually do them much good in the end because the burglars seemed to enter pretty easily and you know there was no motion or entry sensors. Obviously, there was no mobile notifications because not the, you know, the smartphone didn't exist. Cell phones were pretty new at this point. But you know, today what we know, uh, UNC actually did a survey. They surveyed over 400 convicted burglars who were imprisoned. And what they found is that burglars do consider security systems when they're deciding which homes to rob. 
actually 83% of them said they would check if there was an alarm system before doing the burglary. And if there was, 60% are choosing another house. And what if they found the security system mid-burglary? Only 13% of them would continue burglarizing. So even if nothing goes off, just having the home security system really does prevent crimes before they even happen. Whoa. Yeah, so Gabe, you're a man of the law, so tell us about felony murder. As Junior and Raul are both killed while committing this burglary, as you reminded me, I don't know why I said that <laughs> Raul got, I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, it sounds like a legal nightmare. I mean, they were getting killed, but they were also robbing it, so like... Yeah, I mean, it's definitely chaotic. So once again, this is, to be clear, not legal advice for anyone. This is just me talking <laughs> about a movie and uh, what I think would happen. Because I it's actually- It's fiction. <laughs> it's fiction. Um, now, I, I actually am barred in uh, the state of New York, uh, so I can speak a little bit about how I think this would go, but I also was never a criminal defense uh, attorney in any stretch of the imagination. So for certain felons, felonies rather, in the state of New York, uh, if a death occurs while committing a burglary or another felony, it automatically becomes a pretty serious like murder charge. However, there is an affirmative defense if the defendant committed the crime in a group of people and like, you know, he didn't commit, uh, aid or solicit the homicide or wasn't armed with a deadly weapon, didn't know anyone else had a deadly weapon and didn't think any death or serious bodily injury would occur. So that sounds like Burnham to me. Would he get away with it? Would right, he be right, right. So Burnham didn't know Raul was bringing a gun, um, and he thought there would be no one in the house when they robbed the safe. So obviously, uh, he didn't have a deadly weapon. He didn't think that anyone else was. And finally, I think we have to point out the fact that no one, um, in terms of like Meg or Sarah, actually died. Um, so he wouldn't be liable uh, for murder. Okay, and. What does the term affirmative defense mean in plain language? So, uh, yeah, this is, this is fun. Uh, an affirmative defense <laughs> is a fact or facts in a criminal charge or a civil lawsuit that, if proven to be true, mitigates or defeats the consequences of the defendant's potentially uh, illegal act. Um, some more familiar examples of affirmative defenses include self-defense, uh, you know, things like statute of limitations. Uh, you might have heard the insanity defense, which, by the way, uh, very rarely works. Uh, basically, huh. if you, yeah, people, yeah, that's a, yeah. Basically, if you can prove an affirmative defense, you can help the defendant escape the legal consequences of their actions, or at least mitigate. Right? So maybe it's a reduction in your sentence. Uh, maybe you get charged with a lesser crime. There's a whole lot of elements to every criminal case that go beyond this, like simple uh, guilty or innocent. Now, of course. A lot of these elements are going to be really dependent on state law. For example, in some states, the police can kill someone or someone can die, and then other co-conspirators can be charged with felony murder under the law of that state, um, which is really wild. So essentially, uh, it would allow me to go rob somebody, and then if someone dies in that process, I could be charged with felony murder because I was a co-conspirator and someone died, which sounds really wild, but in some states, not New York, uh, that is a potentiality. Yeah. So even if the police kill someone during the burglary. Yeah. They, they could, they could essentially charge the co-conspirator with murder. Wow. The legal gymnastics. That, <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. But that's written into state law. So, you know, and, and I should, I should point out that, um, yes, there are four federal crimes. There are a number of them, but Millions of cases go through the state law system. Very few ultimately are, are federal uh, cases. So your laws regarding crimes are very specific to where you happen to be in the country. Just don't commit crimes. Then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> uh, you, you, you think it's that easy, but <laughs> people commit crimes constantly. Don't even know sometimes. Don't even know. Would you say there's too many regulations? <laughs> I think regulations and crimes are, are, are different, though some people think regulation is a crime. <laughs> Ooh, interesting. Hot take. Hot take. I feel like Elle Woods. <laughs> Legally Blonde's great. Oh, Reese Witherspoon has why, given us so much over the years. Why I went to law school. Really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you saw yourself in her? I saw myself in blonde Reese Witherspoon. You do have a lot in common? Mm-hmm. So, can we answer the titular question here? Are we in the future? I'd say compared to this movie and where home security is today, 
Yes, we are in the future. I think if Sarah and Megan had cellular backup and professional monitoring, they would have escaped within the first 10 minutes. And none of, you know, Junior and Raul would still be with us. <laughs> Not, no way Raul is still, that guy is a, a loose cannon. He, Raul he, was a loose cannon. Yeah, he's, he was going to, he, he'd made his decision to live by the sword a long time ago. <laughs> it was interesting, their psychology. For sure. Um, and I'm going to go with yes as well. Uh, even without a modern home security system, cell phones in general um, have become pretty solid security devices. They're portable, they're Wi-Fi connected, and they allow you to communicate with emergency services without making a sound. So, you know, you can't, of course, forget to charge it. Um, but generally speaking, we're in the future. Well, there you have it. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.